I ch okay, there we go. Um, so uh, Extra Gaming focuses on introducing uh, novel kinds of uh, I.O. devices uh, to encourage exercise while you play. That's not what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, instead, I'm going to be talking about artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence in games. And you might think, wow, um, the intersection of artificial intelligence, uh, games, and healthcare sounds like it might be zero. And so uh, what I want to convince you of in the rest of the talk is that there actually is a really interesting uh, intersection there. Um, so uh, my work, uh, my group is called the Expressive Intelligence Studio. And the whole focus of, uh, of my group is um, artificial intelligence for um, art and entertainment. So that includes kind of, you know, game AI, um, autonomous characters, art generation, experience management and drama management, um, level generation, in that case, level generation for a collapse structure rescue training game. Uh, so this, uh, so the context for all of my research is kind of AI as a medium. AI is a content delivery vehicle or content delivery mechanism. Um, one uh, big focus within that is actually um, AI for story and characters. Uh, as uh, many of you know, you know, most uh, contemporary virtual worlds, and this includes game worlds, tend to have these really rich physical environments and beautifully realized physical environments within which sort of automaton-like, you know, uh, characters walk around and eh, 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 re respond in a very wooden, uh, mechanical and uh, uh, non-expressive way. And so um, a lot of, uh, a big chunk of our focus in the Expressive Intelligence Studio is how do you create AI systems that enable um, characters with rich personality, emotions, self-motivations, change, ability to engage in social relationships. How do you use AI to sort of dynamically craft an experience into a well-formed narrative arc without having to sort of pre-script the experience and create you know, branching stories or something? How can you do this kind of dynamically, which enables a much richer range of response than you could ever possibly get if you have to sort of pre-script the scenario. Um, as a uh, concrete example of that, I'm going to show a couple minutes of a demo tape of Facade. Um, and don't worry, this will get back to, to healthcare <laughs> in a moment. Uh, I'm going to show a, um, a, a brief video clip of Facade, which was a, an experimental game I released uh, a couple of years ago in 2005, 2006. Uh, it's been downloaded eight or 900,000 times now. It's had some pretty significant impact within the commercial uh, game industry. And Facade was uh, an experiment in creating a game where the entire gameplay is focused on social relationships with this couple that you're visiting, Trip and Grace. Um, the setup in Facade is that you, the player, arrive at this couple's door. You've been invited over for drinks. Knock, knock, knock. That's all you know when you first start. Unbeknownst to you, uh, this couple's marriage is actually in serious trouble, and uh, it's been sort of building up to a point where, in fact, tonight's the night. It's all going to explode and sort of how it explodes, how they feel about each other and how they feel about you by the end of the evening depends on sort of how you play and interact with them, which includes interacting with them in natural language, kind of unrestricted natural language. And this isn't just keyword search. We are actually doing parsing and natural language understanding and so forth. Um, and so you can kind of think of it as an interactive who's afraid of Virginia Woolf, uh, where uh, you're, you're the visitor showing up, and as you interact with these characters, you're changing social relationships, you're changing emotional dynamics, you're learning more about what's led them to this impasse, and it was purposely designed to have to be played multiple times, because every time you play it, you're going to get a very different slice through what's up with these characters and, and what brought them to this, to this impasse um, as a function of how you interact. So um, if we could, uh, I don't think I have access to the um, directory. If you could start the facade, um, it's called the facade trailer, I think, or facade demo reel. Uh, yeah, facade highlight reel uh, uh, right there. And do we have sound? Ah, I'm so happy you could make it. OK, well, we don't have, have any video. So long. How's it going, man? Um, What's happening is I know with um, Windows Media, you have to not show it uh, locally. Oh, we're great. I mean, really, really great. Come on in. Yeah, it can't Andrew? drive your local monitor and the projector Hi, at the same time. Hi, how are you? Oh, it's so nice to see you. It feels like it's been forever. Yeah, how, how, how are you doing? Uh, I just asked him that. Well, I can ask him too. <laughs> and I've got to say, you look really good. 
Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's too bad if we're not able to show. I mean, if I was driving it myself, I, I know what to do, but okay, excellent. There we go. I guess it's just the artist in me dying to get out. You know, for this corner of the room, I had a desire for something so, big um, and bold. with these characters, like all the yeah, facial expressions, body movements, so on, are being dynamically generated. That isn't pre-animated or pre-scripted. Ah, <sighs> thank you. I knew you'd give me an honest <sighs> answer. <laughs> it's just decorating, for Christ's sake. You're turning it into something. You know, Trip, if you hadn't convinced me to go into advertising, I could have painted that painting on the wall instead of buying it. That's the problem with this goddamn apartment. Lousy acoustics. And then Grace buys all of this ridiculously expensive furniture that just sucks up your voice when you're talking. I feel like someone's muffling me when I sit on her new couch. <sighs> See, Grace? As always, you're the only one unhappy with your decorating. Right, I know. I'll never be satisfied with it. I shouldn't get so obsessed about it. It's just not worth it. Ugh, <sighs> where's my drink? Oh, hey. So You're there are some physical me. actions oh, you can take. That's nice of you. Like Grace, hugging, you glad we comforting, him kissing. Um. <clears throat> Brr. I'm going to have to turn up the thermostat if we're going to talk about sex. <laughs> Trip, no. That's not funny. Come on. Andrew. You know that flirting with me is only going to make me wish I'd married you instead of Trip. <clears throat> okay, okay, that's enough, you two lovebirds. Okay, Andrew, I think this evening is over. You've got to leave. So here we're just sort of showing There's a range so of much responses you can expect that up, uh, you typical know? players do oh, when, no. when interacting with the song. Andrew, I just realized. I'm sorry. What? I haven't gotten us drinks. When it comes to drinking, I have the simplest tastes. I'm uh, always satisfied with the best. So, what's your poison? Can I interest you in a single malt scotch? It's primo. I served them at our last party. They were a smash. Martinis. Perfect. Classic. Great idea. Well, it didn't take long for you two to bond or whatever. Trip thinks he's at his classiest when he's on the serving end of a swizzle stick. Why don't I make us one of my new drink inventions? I call it Grace's Inner Soul. It's a mixture of Chardonnay, bitters, and lots of ice. Okay, we can stop at this point. Um, so this gives you no, some sense of Andrew, uh, interacting in with these word. characters, but um, in a sense what we have here is uh, kind of a bad marriage simulator, right? Um, what you have is uh, autonomously intelligent characters. Um, they're pursuing goals. They're engaged in emotional relationships. They have got this backstory they know about. They're fighting with each other and drawing the player in. But you also have another uh, AI component um, that we call the drama manager that's sort of monitoring the long-term progress of the story and trying to make sure that it's forming into kind of a well-formed Aristotelian narrative arc as the player interacts. But again, not in a sort of pre-scripted uh, branching story kind of way. So as soon as my slides are uh, back up, Yeah, I know, Windows Media is a, is a pain. <laughs> All right. So it's, oops, someone else, okay. I was fighting. All right. So, um, you know, that gives an example of when I talk about sort of character and story AI, the kinds of experiences you can realize that way. Another project going on in the lab right now is a collapse structure rescue training game that was uh, got a little bit of preliminary funding on a NASA art project. Uh, it was just enough to kind of get it started. Um, and uh, in there, the, the big AI research challenge is dynamically generating new training scenarios. So um, any training game in which you know, you've hired a whole bunch of animators and artists and they've handcrafted some beautiful training level and so forth, well, that's sort of static content that you know, as you hand that off to say firefighters who are training for collapse structure uh, rescue, um, they can go through that scenario once, maybe twice, and now they've sort of wrung all the juice there is um, out of that training game. Um, and some, you would have to dump a whole bunch of more content and pay a bunch of animators and level designers and so on to create new content to, uh, to continue uh, having any training uh, 
having any uh, um, uh, training usefulness. Um, well, the idea here is, well, what if we can sort of put that sort of level designer, scenario designer uh, piece in the box so it can dynamically generate games um, in response to pedagogical goals that a fireman might set up. You know, I want to uh, experiment with pulling, or uh, I want to uh, train on pulling live victims out of a pancake structure in which there's risk of fire, for instance, and then the system generates that. Um, that moves into sort of more general game generation work where we're actually trying to sort of, in a sense, put game designers in a box and we're currently generating small kind of cell phone mini games um, completely automatically where um, you can sort of dial in high level goals for what you want the game to accomplish uh, and it sits there and figures out what game mechanics to put together, what thematic mappings to put onto the game and so forth, automatically generates some code, in this case it's J2ME, uh, um, cell phone code, and voila, you've got kind of a custom game. So what might you do uh, with all this stuff in the context of, of healthcare? Well, in, uh, with the autonomous character work we're doing, the most obvious um, uh, application is patient communication. Um, this can be uh, training on sort of difficult situations like breaking the news to someone they have cancer, for instance, and what are the ways of doing that, what are typical ways that, uh, that uh, um, patients respond or uh, react to that news. Uh, there are, you know, as, as you know, there are a number of kind of virtual patient um, simulators out there that allow you to engage in, uh, um, you know, uh, kind of simulated, uh, um, uh, you know, simulated procedures with patients. Uh, but the, the model of kind of the patient as far as being able to talk to them, how they respond to the procedures and so on, is very wooden and prescripted currently in these patient simulators I've seen. Uh, this would be a way to move to um, uh, a much richer, more expressive and realistic kind of personality simulations for patients, uh, patient simulators. Um, lifestyle coaches. Um, so there's an, you know, an increasing interest now in you know, how can we you know, deal with the obesity uh, uh, epidemic in America, how can we create technologies that, that, that encourage people to have sort of healthy lifestyles and one approach would be, well, you've got this sort of personal lifestyle coach who's tracking information about your activity during the day, about you know, your diet and so forth, and offering suggestions, developing a rapport with you over time. Um, emergency response training is a very concrete one that um, we've currently got a little bit of work on. Um, definitely uh, looking for more support and funding <laughs> in that area. Um, custom health management games, so moving to this sort of uh, game generation work. You know, you've got uh, uh, a person who's managing uh, diabetes and you can, you know, input information about how they're um, uh, how they've been maintaining their blood sugar uh, during the day and so forth, and have the system uh, automatically generate little games that in a sense kind of gamify having to manage their diabetes, right? And this is sort of a, uh, something that at the Game Developers Conference this last year was kind of a, a big topic of conversation, was moving games kind of out of, you know, kind of the, you know, closed little virtual worlds in which you normally think of gaming happening, and, and talking about what does it mean to kind of gamify everyday life. Right, to use the same kinds of reward structures, reward ramps, um, uh, difficulty ramping, and so forth. There's a lot of uh, game design heuristics that have been developed over the years that are extremely effective at creating powerful motivational structures for human beings. Right now we're applying to these virtual worlds. What happens when we start pulling them out of the virtual world and sort of gamifying everyday life? And finally, more generally, kind of organizational simulation at Serious Games for Health a couple of years ago. I actually had someone come up to me after seeing a facade demo and say, God, I'd love to do something about uh, training for sort of emergency room management. And, you know, it's like late at night, a whole bunch of cases come in. Um, how do we, you know, how could people sort of train on what it's like <laughs> in an emergency room when, you know, all hell breaks loose? Um, and this sort of general kind of organizational simulation with, um, you know, sort of simulated people that have real reactions, real emotions, and so on uh, would be potentially very powerful. Um, just the last little bit, um, this is my last slide. I want to mention that um, at UC Santa Cruz is the first University of California campus to have a degree in computer game design. Um, so this is sort of a serious major focus um, on the campus. We've hired, uh, we have offers out to two more faculty this year, bringing uh, our group of faculty who are sort of focused on uh, game design and game technology to five now uh, on the campus. Um, we, uh, our computer game design degree has been, the undergraduate degree has uh, only been in existence for two years now. The first 
crop of students came in in fall 2007, the second crop in fall 2008, bringing in sort of 100 students each year in the first two years. Uh, we're now, I believe, officially the largest degree program in the School of Engineering at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and my Expressive Intelligence Studio, uh, as I mentioned, there's something like 10 PhD students and four master students and several undergrads involved in that one uh, game research uh, group. And there are a number of other groups springing up now as we're staffing up uh, the, um, the game faculty. So I just want to mention this to say that it's, you know, this, is, this is sort of big business at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and so uh, I, you know, I hope for as, as people within the UC system become interested in games, and particularly serious games, uh, that they consider partnering with UC Santa Cruz since we have such a, a strong focus. All right, thanks. Uh, I'm going to move things along.